Hi, I am Peter Deal, and in this uh, session, I'd like to share a little bit about our recent work on how in deep reinforcement learning, we might be able to make learning from pixels as efficient as learning from spit. So the big question here is, can visual RL achieve the same data efficiency as RL that gets to operate on state? Of course, as roboticists, we know the benefit of access to state is that it summarizes all you need to know about the environment into a small set of variables. And so you might expect that learning from state can be more efficient than learning from pixels. So let's take a look here at the prior state of the art. The plot on the left, this is for a cart pole swing up. We have two types of learning curves. Both use the same reinforcement learning method, D4PG, but in blue, D4PG has access to state variables directly. In green, D4PG only has access to pixels. Same for the graph shown in the middle, it's for a uh, reacher task. In blue, D4PG has access to state only. In green, it has access to pixels only. We see in both cases, the learning curve goes up a lot more quickly when having access to state. Higher is better here, higher means higher reward. In fact, we see that it takes about 50 million more training steps to get to the same performance when learning from pixels compared to when learning from state. So these results here seem to suggest that, yes, learning from state is a lot more effective. You need a lot less training data, a lot less trial and error before you can get to a high level of performance. But in our work, we actually want to question this and want to say, well, maybe we should be able to learn as quickly from pixels as from state, because intrinsically, if the state information is somewhere in the pixels, maybe you should be able to extract it and still learn just as efficiently as if somebody had presented state in a compact form to you. So let's take a look at how we might get there. We're going to start with some results in contrastive learning and computer vision, and then we'll do something quite similar in reinforcement learning under curl and brad. I'll say more about that later, and then I'll discuss some new opportunities for future work. So contrastive learning and computer vision. In computer vision, as of about a half year ago, it was shown for the first time that it's possible to achieve ImageNet classification accuracy, vertical axis here on the left is accuracy, higher is better, ImageNet classification accuracy in blue by a combination of contrastive learning and supervised learning that outperforms supervised learning. More specifically, this was on the ImageNet data set, and it was shown that if you only have access to a fraction of the labels, supervised learning is not gonna do as well, it needs more labels to do better, whereas with contrastive learning, in addition to supervised learning, you can leverage the unlabeled data to outperform just supervised learning on the labeled data. Then a couple months ago in March, Jeff Hinton and collaborators showed with SimClear, a new approach to contrastive learning, that you, if you have a large enough neural network, horizontal axis here is size of the network, large enough neural network, SimClear in the top right is outperforming even supervised learning. So these were two big breakthroughs showing that with contrastive learning, which I'll say more about in a moment, it's possible to learn from unlabeled data some representations inside your neural net that then allow you to learn from a small amount of labeled data to do still really well. What is this contrastive learning business? Well, it's an additional objective you use in your learning process and you can use it on unsupervised data. So for example, here's an image. We know it's an image of a dog, but the contrastive learning process is not gonna have access to the label. It just gets this image. Then it makes two different augmentations of this image. One is mirror image left, right, and cropped, the other one is recolored. So two different augmentations. Both of these augmentations retain the semantics of the image. The dog remains a dog under these two transformations. Then neural nets encode these augmented images into some latent vectors, zi and zj. Contrastive learning then says that since these two latent vectors came from augmentations of the same image, these latent vectors should agree. More specifically, they should have a high inner product. In contrast to inner products with embeddings coming from encoding other images. And so the equation on the right here shows we want to maximize agreement in the numerator we have inner product similarity between ZI and ZJ we want to maximize in the denominator we normalize by negative examples where we want a small similarity. So very simple idea, very, very powerful. So how can we think about the same idea in the concept of reinforcement learning? Well, in reinforcement learning, our agent will collect data, put it into a replay buffer. Then as it's learning, it'll take data from that replay buffer, take that data and follow the encoding path and from there go into an actual network and a critic network to do the reinforcement learning updates. That's the top path in green. 
That would be reinforcement learning on its own. What we now add in curl is an extra path at the bottom here where we generate augmented observations, just like in Simplia, we take observations, we make different augmentations, and then we're gonna have a contrastive loss on these augmented observations to hopefully, just like in Simplia, learn a good representation of the visual observations that will allow us to learn more quickly than if we did not have this additional contrastive loss. So a couple of questions we need to answer. Exactly how do we generate these query key pairs? What is gonna be our similarity measure? And what's our architecture? One thing to quickly note here is that as we take things from our replay buffer, we always feed four frames here in one go. And the reason we feed multiple frames in one go is because if you only get a single image, well, in robotics, velocity tends to be part of the state. Angular velocity tends to be part of the state. So if only a single frame, there's no way the information is there. By having a couple sequential frames, you can expect that the information is there. Sure, it's not extracted yet for you into state variables, but at least in principle, it might be there in the pixels. So query key pairs, we focused on, well, we actually investigated many different variations, but the one we zoned in on in the end as most effective is random cropping. So we have an input, a uh, stack of frames, and then we random crop in two different ways. And it has to learn that these are effectively the same underlying situation. And so we want high similarity between the embeddings of these two um, random augmentations. Then how do we measure similarity? The Sinclair paper had just the inner product between query, query and key. We found that we need a learned weight matrix to make this work in our scenario. And then there is a work in parallel to Sinclair that is very, very similar to Moco from Kai Ming He and collaborators at Facebook. And what they showed is that it can actually be very beneficial to have momentum on the key and coding. And we empirically showed also in our case where we're doing reinforcement learning with contrastive losses that having momentum shown in red helps a lot. Okay, with those three pieces in place, let's take a look at our results. This is the main result. What are we looking at here? These are learning curves again. So horizontal axis is the amount of experience collected by the agent in the environment. For example, top left, the ball and cup catch task. Next one, card pull balance. Next one, card pull balance bars, and so forth. Then on the vertical axis, we have reward accumulated. And so the higher you go, the better, the more reward. What we see in gray is what happens when the agent gets access to state when learning, in red when only having access to pixels. The very surprising, at least very surprising at the time, when we got these results for the first time a couple months ago, the very surprising result here is that the red curve almost always keeps up with the gray curve, showing that learning from pixels can actually be as efficient as learning from state in most tasks in the DeepMind control suite. And so this is a very surprising result at first because, well, you know, normally you think you need state to learn maximally efficiently, but it turns out, thanks to this contrastive loss, the neural network can extract enough information about what's in the images, be able to learn as efficiently from images as from state, at least in most scenarios. And we'll dive deeper into the couple scenarios where that's not the case a little later. Then we did a comparison. So we have the first time matching learning from state when needing to learn from pixels, then we compare with prior state of the art in learning from pixels. There's a few model free approaches like ours, like pixel SAC uh, and Slack. And then there's a model based approach called Planet. And we see that the red curve, which is the approach we present, soft data critic, which is model free plus contrastive loss, curl approach outperforms prior state of the art methods on these tasks. We also looked at um, the performance at the end of. 100,000 steps in learning, 500,000 steps in learning, and we see that consistently curl outperforms prior state-of-the-art methods, including prior state-of-the-art model-based methods like Planet and Dreamer. And this is another interesting finding here because often it's thought that by being model-based, you're going to be more efficient. But it turns out that, in fact, by having a contrastive loss combined with a model-free method, we can outperform these model-based methods. Now, might be room for future work here, combining contrastive with model-based, you can see where that leads. We also compared on Atari. Uh, the prior state of the art on Atari for a model based is a method called simple. The prior state of the art on Atari for model free is rainbow. And we're looking in the low uh, frame regime where you have access to 100,000 frames, which is about a half hour of gameplay. And we want to see in a half hour of gameplay, which for humans is enough to learn to play a game pretty well, how do you stack up against humans, but also against prior state of the art reinforced learning methods. And we see that usually our method curl, which builds on top of rainbow, outperforms rainbow without curl and outperforms state-of-the-art model base called simple. Comparing to human performance in two of the games here, we get 
90 plus percent compared to human performance after 100,000 frames. And in eight out of nine games, we'll get double digit performance relative to human score after 100,000 frames, which is about a half hour of game experience. So this is very fast learning. Usually in RL, you think it's going to take weeks, months, and so forth in terms of human uh, real-time experience to get to a decent performance. We see here we can actually learn from a relatively small amount of experience to do pretty well. Now let's take a look at some ablations to better understand what are the most important parts of this method. First thing we looked at is how about those environments in Deep Mind Control Suite where curl is not able to match state-based learning. What's going on there? The first experiment we ran is we said, okay, let's take a look at prior state of the art, model free reinforcement learning, and run it for a really long time. And when running it for a really long time, shown at the bottom here, um, the green curves are from pixels, blue curve from state. What we see happen in these environments is that actually there was a gap even at the very end after a very long time of training. What this suggests is that it's maybe not so much a matter of curl not being able to extract in an unsupervised way state information. It's more a problem that maybe information just isn't there. No matter what you do, no matter how long you learn, if you have to do it from pixels, you might not be able to get there. So we decided to dig a little deeper and ask the question, well, if that might be the case, we should be able to see this by setting up the following problem. What if we set up a supervised learning problem? We collect data, we collect both the frames, the images, and the state. And we then set up a supervised learning problem where we try to learn the mapping from images to state. And if indeed the images don't have the information, for example, images wouldn't have contact forces directly visible, and maybe they're needed for some of these tasks to do well. If images don't allow you to extract the state, then that could be a uh, underlying explanation for why learning from pixels cannot match learning from state in those specific environments where we don't see the match. And indeed, that's what we're seeing. So we see on the left here is the error in state prediction from images, a large supervised learning data set. And we see that larger error very directly correlates with not being able to learn from pixels to perform as well as when learning from state. So our current hypothesis here is that on the environments where there is enough information in the pixels to extract state, with curl, we can learn as efficiently or almost as efficiently from pixels as one could do from state. And then in some environments in DeepMind Control Suite, the information just isn't accessible. So you're not going to be able to learn as well from pixels because the information just isn't there. Then another question you could ask is, remember in the beginning I said we feed in stacked frames. So we feed in three, four frames, and that's our image observation because that way we can get some notion of velocity, angular rates, and so forth. So you can ask the question, how much of our representation learning through the contrastive loss is related to temporal aspects versus within a single image? So what we did here is an experiment where in green, the learning curve has curl where it only has access to the contrastive loss to single frame at a time, whereas in red, it gets the stack of frames. And we see actually single frame learning does almost as well as multiple frame learning, suggesting that most of what we learn in terms of representation learning is going from image, single image to what you can extract about the state in that single image. Another question you could ask is, well, given we set up the network to simultaneously learn against rewards and against the contrastive loss, how do we know that, you know, if maybe in the future we don't have access to reward and we want to already learn something interesting, can we do that? How do we know that the contrastive loss will learn the relevant things? Or is there actually a danger maybe that it might not learn the right things and we really need that reward signal to learn the right representation? Well, we compared here the original curl in red within green, what we call detached curl, where the reinforcement learning loss for the actor and the critic does not get to propagate through the representation. So only curl can do the representation learning. And then that learned representation is whatever it is due to the contrastive loss is what's fed into the actor and the critic. And we see that we can do almost as well that way, suggesting that the representation learning in itself is actually very good and does not require any reward access to learn the right representations. Okay, so that's curl. What we showed there is that we can combine contrastive loss with reinforcement learning loss to learn as efficiently or almost as efficiently from pixels as from state. Now, one question we asked ourselves is, it seems like the really important thing here is this generating two frames that are somehow coming from the same original but are considered equivalent. That's a lot like data augmentation. How far can we get with just data augmentation? So you have experience, your rollouts, and then we're not gonna have a contrastive loss here. Instead, inside the reinforcement learning pipeline, we're gonna have a split. We're gonna generate those two augmentations. 
And after we generate those two mentitions, they're both going to be fed into the reinforcement learning box. We looked at many types of augmentations, cropping, grayscale, cutout, cutout color, flip, and so forth. And we then evaluated how well reinforcement learning with these augmentations does relative to curl and relative to prior state of the art, planet, dreamer, and so forth that we already compared with earlier in this presentation. What we see is that Rad actually is able to almost consistently outperform, and not always, but very often outperform uh, curl, and of course, all, all the, the past methods. What this shows is that likely a lot of the strength of curl comes from the augmentations, turning single observation into multiple observations that we know are of the same thing and requiring that agreement, or in this case, feeding them into the same reinforcement learning loss. Here are the learning curves in terms of how fast each of these methods ramps up. In gray is again from state, in red is curl, and in blue we have rad. And we see that indeed rad is quite comparable, often better, not always better than curl, showing the importance of the data augmentations uh, in terms of learning very fast from image observations, almost as fast as from state. We can also then ablate and take a look at, okay, which combinations are the most important? Uh, and so, Cropping turns out to be the most important one, with the other ones also playing a role, but it's cropping that dominates um, in terms of how well you're going to do. If you leave out cropping, your performance will drop very, very quickly. So, under the hood, if we train with RL loss with no augmentation, here's the activation pattern you see on the image. If we do it with augmentation, and especially if we look at cropping, we see that it really activates on where the robot is in the image. So we see that the augmentations play a big role in having the neural network zone in on what's important. Okay, so what did we cover? We started from the question, can learning from pixels be as efficient as learning from state? Or does there need to be a fundamental gap? There used to be a big gap. Then we showed that with curl and with RAM, we're actually able to bridge that gap and learn almost as efficiently from pixels as from state. This was, this was for DeepMind Control Suite, uh, where we did extensive comparisons. Now, there were still a few exceptions, but we found that in those environments, pixels might actually not have the state information anywhere available, suggesting that you, know, you can't actually learn the same level of performance because the information just is not available. Now, let's just put this in terms of future work. Well, first consideration is how about curl versus rad? Rad, the, the, just RL with data augmentation matches, often even slightly outperforms curl. Why might that be? Our current thinking is just because it gets to fully focus on the task at hand. It doesn't have to do with contrastive losses, just focus on reinforcement learning loss under augmentation schemes. And it's a little simpler, so you might say, okay, we should maybe always use rad. But actually, curl has its own advantages. Curl can be applied even without reward function. It can be applied off policy, random rollouts can be applied for multitask problems more readily. And so the beauty of curls, they can do representation learning in a way that's independent of whether you have RL loss available or not. What's missing from these current contrastive representation learning methods? Let's look at image classification, let's look at reinforcement learning. In both cases, we're effectively looking at single image or single uh, short sequence of images. What's still missing is incorporating temporal structure. A lot of what we learn when we run reinforcement learning is about how the environment, that the states in the environment are connected to each other, which state is easy to reach from which other state. Those are the kind of things that when you look at a single frame or single frame stack, you're not getting to extract. And so a big open question here is, can we add yet another contrastive loss maybe that leads to more efficient learning of, learning of the connectivity of the environment which in turn might enable the agent to do more efficient exploration and or more efficient credit assignment and queue learning, policy learning to learn even faster than what we've seen so far. And by the way, this is something that could potentially be done both for state-based and image-based learning. All right, that's it for me. Thank you.